Hello and welcome into the Lockdown of Wolves podcast. This is the post game podcast. Today on the show, the Wolves fell flat to the Spurs on Sunday in San Antonio, and it was a complete system failure. Both ends of the floor, lackadaisical defense, uh, mostly selfish offense, inefficient offense. We'll break down the exact, uh, I guess, in depth what went wrong in this game and the questions for the rotation moving forward. What head coach Chris Finch has to decide. Um, as the Wolves move into a much tougher part of the schedule. It's all upcoming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked on Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Happy Monday, everybody. And uh, not a victory Monday. This is the post game podcast following a disappointing Wolves win on Sunday. Uh, we're going to get into all of the, the, nitty gritty details from this one here in just a moment. First, a big thank you for making Locked On Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, Locked On Wolves is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find this show. You can also uh, download the brand new Locked On Sports Minnesota app on either Roku or Amazon Fire TV. You can listen to all the Locked On Minnesota podcasts. More great local sports coverage 24-7. It's absolutely free. Again, Locked On Sports Minnesota app on Roku or Amazon Fire TV. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at Locked On T-Wolves and then my account, which is at B Beacon. That's two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, so Wolves lose to the Spurs on Sunday, and uh, they end up losing by nine. This was a game they lo- they trailed by as many as 19. It was pretty much, I don't know there was actually a wire-to-wire win for the Spurs, but pretty close to it. I mean, this was a 10-point a halftime deficit a 15 point deficit going to the fourth wolves had it back down to 10 in the final minute of the third quarter pu- got pushed back to to 15 headed to the fourth and the wolves made it a little interesting got to within four points a couple different times in the fourth quarter we'll talk about the lineup that was able to do that here in just a minute but uh, really kind of an overall i mean any game you score just 98 points in even if you win you know that something didn't go right offensively with the number of possessions used in nba games in the year 2022 um, and and the pace at which the Wolves play, if they ever score under 100, not only are they unlikely to win, but even if they do, something went wrong offensively for Minnesota. And that absolutely was the case in this game. And if you didn't watch the game, you just glanced at the box score, you'd say, oh man, they shot 13% from three. That's the biggest issue. Well, yeah, that was a big issue. <laughs> it certainly was significant. Um, I would argue if we're going to talk three-point shooting, the bigger issue is that the Spurs made 16 of 40. We're 40% from three. So the three-point deficit the Wolves were playing at was 12 made threes or 36 points. The Spurs scored 36 more points outside the arc than Minnesota did because they made 16 threes, the Wolves four. So yeah, that was a big deal. Um, But the bigger issue for me was, was defensively as weird as that is in a game where you only scored 98, the bigger issue for me was defensively. They simply could not contain on the perimeter and it led to really an avalanche of issues. Um, And so that's my biggest takeaway in this game. The perimeter defense for Minnesota was miserable. On the ball defense, just bad across the board. So D'Angelo Russell's probably the biggest culprit. Anthony Edwards had some really bad possessions on the perimeter. Um, Off the bench, Austin Rivers played limited minutes in the first half, wasn't great defensively. Bryn Forbes really is never great defensively and wasn't good defensively in this game. Jalen Noel, same thing. Um, Even to an extent, I mean, Jade McDaniels didn't have his typical. I mean, he was probably the Wolves' best defender still in this game, but didn't have a fantastic game himself. It was just the lack of ball pressure defensively, the the inability to get through screens, which has been um, a major issue throughout D'Angelo Russell's career. It's something he improved at last year, but Anthony Edwards trailing ball handlers through screens, just failing to get around, um, you know, dribble handoff actions, failure to get around uh, ball screens and allowing the Spurs to penetrate draw help defense and then kick. It was, it's a really simple concept, right? You beat your man off the dribble, you pull in help defenders, and then you, you kick the ball to the open man. 
So Doug McDermott was often the beneficiary of that in this game. Doug McDermott scored 23 off the bench, seven of 14 on threes. McDermott got up 14 threes. Doug McDermott, really anybody, should never get 14 threes off. That means that you're continually helping. And yeah, the Spurs called a couple plays for him, but I mean, not any more than that, right? Like he wasn't the focus of the Spurs offense, but he managed to score 23 points because the Wolves kept helping off of him. And he's obviously an extremely good three-point shooter. That was a major mistake by Minnesota. And I don't know that tactically that was anything that like, I mean, Chris Finch probably could have uh, made sure that that didn't happen. Right. But like, I mean, the Spurs were intentional with getting the ball to that side of the floor, pulling in the help defender and then kicking it to a guy who could shoot and Doug McDermott. That was as simple as that is time and time again. That's what the Spurs did. Keldon Johnson benef- uh, benefited from it as well, although although Johnson was had the ball in his hands a lot, initiating offense for the Spurs. He had 25 points, eight assists in this game. He also turned it over five times. But, I mean, he had the ball in his hands a lot, right? Keldon Johnson is the best player on the Spurs team, and he has been great in the three games against the Wolves. And he made five threes on 10 attempts himself. So Johnson and McDermott combined for 12 of the 16 made threes for the Spurs. Nobody else had more than one. They were a combined 12 of 24, so 50% from three, McDermott and Keldon Johnson. Um, the Wolves just, and it all stemmed from a lack of ball pressure, right? These open threes because of this driving kick action where the Wolves got sucked into, into stopping the ball because they couldn't contain on the perimeter one-on-one. They couldn't contain a pick-and-roll game. Um, we saw this in, you know, Carl Anthony Towns played some drop in this game as well when he was in the game as the center and didn't do a great job at containing. Rudy Gobert... This was not his best all-run game as a Minnesota Timberwolf. Uh, probably his worst so far as a Wolf. Nine points, 12 rebounds, a couple of blocks, uh, four of 11 shooting. He missed a number of bunnies around the rim that he should have made. And defensively, just didn't have the impact. I don't think he had the impact he typically does in the paint. Um, now, the Wolves dominated points in the paint. That's another weird thing about this game, and we'll talk more about this here in a minute. But if you, again, just look at the box screen, be like, oh, the Spurs turned it over eight more times than the Wolves, 19 to 11. Oh, uh, points in the paint. The Timberwolves won points in the paint 64 to 34. They were a plus 30 with points in the paint, but yet they still lost this game. Well, of course, we already said they were a minus 36 outside the arc. So that right there, there's a six point difference uh, between those two and the Spurs come out on top there. And that's, you know, I mean, this is apples to apples, but that's six of the nine points in the final deficit, right? Uh, So points in the paint, turnovers, you win those battles, great. But you lose massively in the three point battle. Um, and they also lost the free throw battle, by the way, they shot worse at the line and attempted five less free throws. So there were minus five at the line as well. So that's where a lot of the issues were free throw line, three point line, but it all stems from the lack of ability to contain the basketball. And, and yeah, we could talk about the guys that aren't on the team this year, but that doesn't help moving forward. Right. We like, what do the wolves do on Tuesday against Phoenix? Uh, I mean, you don't have Patrick Beverly's not going to be on this team on Tuesday night. They're not going to have Jared Vanderbilt to play a blitz scheme in pick and roll Tuesday night. Like that's not changing in 48 hours. What's Chris Finch going to do to help this team turn the corner in a very short order. But uh, the biggest issue, despite the 98 points, despite the 14% from three, the biggest issue is ball contain on the perimeter um, in in this game. All right. A couple more key takeaways from uh, this game that I have for you. And then I want to get into an individual studs and duds. So we're going to do that here next. First though, let's talk about our title sponsors from today's show. And that of course, our friends at bet online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting football and the start of the brand new basketball season. We're still not even two weeks in to NBA action. Of course, the start of the NHL season as well. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis in every single game. Uh, The teeth of the football season. So like the peak of college football, you basically now we kind of know which teams are or what the NFL, who knows? Nobody ever knows. There's only like three good teams in the NFL anyway. It's like what? Uh, the Bills, the Chiefs, and and the Eagles, and then like a bunch of, like those are easily the three best teams. I, I know the Vikings are still a one loss team, but I you know I don't know that they're quite on that level. And there's a bunch of like 500 ish teams. It's really tough to handicap what the NFL actually is. But anyway, if you're going to bet football, bet online is the place you got to be. As always, they remain your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB. MMA, boxing, golf, NHL, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts.
Thanks again for making Locked On Wolves your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today, available on this app you're listening on now, also on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Okay. A couple other takeaways from this one. We talked about the issues on the perimeter defensively. Talked uh, briefly talked about uh, the Spurs turnovers, which leads me into my next point. The Spurs turned it over 19 times. The Wolves only turned it over 11 times. You would assume that the Wolves would have had a significant edge in transition and fast break points. You know, being plus eight in the turnover category and all. Well, if you assume that, you'd assume wrong. The Wolves only outscored the Spurs 17 to 16 in fast break points in this game. They were a plus one in transition, despite being a plus eight in the turnover battle. Now, you know, obviously there's some dead ball turnovers mixed in there. And I think the Spurs actually had a, a decently high number of dead ball turnovers in this game, throwing the ball out of bounds, traveling, et cetera. They had, I don't know, probably three travels in this game, I'm guessing, but I remember at least two off the top of my head. So those aren't necessarily going to lead directly to fast break points, but you would think if you have an eight turnover advantage, that there would be a greater edge in fast break points. Now, the Wolves have been awful in transition on both ends of the floor so far this season. And I actually think, you know, I I, I haven't gone through and compared live ball to dead ball turnovers, but I actually think the Wolves' transition defense is, is partly to blame here. Now, obviously, offensively, if you turn them over, you got to have more than 17 fast break points on 19 Spurs turnovers. Um, but the, turno- the transition defense was bad, too. So they weren't playing fast enough on offense, which is absolutely true. D'Angelo Russell de- deserves blame for this. I think on some level, Anthony Edwards even does, even though he's typically trying to go fast. Sometimes he slows it down. Sometimes he pulls the ball back out and thinks he can hit a step back three. I, I don't know that, you know, for he didn't score until like midway through the third quarter in this game, by the way, Anton. Um, I think there were times where he wasn't aggressive enough with the ball in his hands. D'Angelo Russell doesn't really seem to love pushing the pace ever. That's always been one of the issues. And I think, and this is just like, this would make sense. This is logical. That's one of the points of contention between he and Chris Finch. It has to be. Finch wants to play fast. The Wolves played at the fastest pace of any team in the league last season. uh, Or maybe they were second in pace, I think. This year, coming into this game, they were third in pace. The Spurs, by the way, were fourth. So both teams wanted to play fast. Neither one really did efficiently because there were only a total of, what, 33 fast break points in this game between the two teams combined. But the Spurs were better at it than the Wolves, and the Wolves compounded things by having such terrible transition defense. Once again, bad floor balance, you know, not contesting and and uh, uh, or, or not. I'm sorry, not shooting and getting back on defense. Instead, it was shooting and watching the shot, or shooting and you know, not really even crashing the boards either. Being in no man's land, which is like Ant does that a lot. I remember that was something Andrew Wiggins did all the time in a Timberwolves uniform was shoot a jumper and then kind of linger instead of crashing or getting back and just being in no man's land. That happens a little bit too much to Ant. It happens to D'Lo at times. And as much as the transition defense seemed to have improved a little bit against the Lakers on Friday, that was not the case in San Antonio on Sunday night. Uh, transition defense was bad. The offense was was slow in transition. And when your half-court offense is struggling as much as this one is, as the Timberwolves half-court offense has this season, you have to get the easy ones in transition. You've got to get out and run any opportunity you have to 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 get the easy buckets, but also to kind of sp- to to spark plug your own offense, right? To get it going. Um, last season, the Wolves remember defensively. I'll, I'll quickly hit these numbers, but last year, remember the Wolves were terrible defensive rebounding the ball. They fouled a ton. Their defensive foul rate was terrible, but they were like top three in steal rate, top three in block rate, um, and defensively they were top ten for much of the first half of the season, top twelve. Because they played such an aggressive defense, they blitz pick and rolls, they turned teams over, they jumped passing lanes, they were flying around like crazy. And yeah, that led to some buckets on the back end. And as the season wore on, and I've talked about this at nauseum on the show, they played better coach teams, they played better prepared teams, just better teams in general. And, you know, opposition's opposition offenses figured out how to beat this blitz defense. And it's not a sustainable system. It's why the Wolves had to back off of it a little bit as the season wore on. Guys got hurt, guys got tired, teams figured out how to exploit it. But you saw the Wolves increase the ball pressure just a little bit late in this game. And I remember a week ago sitting here, almost a week ago now, I remember the Wolves were blown out by the Spurs last Monday. They beat them last Wednesday saying, why didn't the Wolves apply more ball pressure, more even like token three-quarter court pressure, which is not D'Lo's thing, right? He doesn't want to do that. But if the Wolves could just pressure a little bit more, 
a young Spurs team with some shaky ball handlers without too many great, like true point guards, true, you know, initiators of offense who can calm a team down, speed them up just a little. You have the added benefit of then you get out and transition and get your own buckets. It's not just about stopping the Spurs from scoring. It's about getting the court flipped and getting the ball back the other way quickly and getting the easy dunk, the layup, the open three to the trailer and transition. Those are not things that the Wolves are doing right now. And the t- a team like the Spurs, that's a team you could do it against. Do you think you're going to be able to turn Chris Paul over six times on Tuesday night? No, that's not going to happen. You're not likely to turn the Spurs over 19 times like you did to the, or excuse me, the Suns 19 times like you did to the Spurs on Sunday. This is when you need to get into that rhythm of let's get the steal, let's get the easy bucket, let's get this offense going. We'll figure out the half court stuff later. We'll we'll get Rudy some buckets later. Let's let's win this game, but improve the transition offense and defense for that matter. Um, not that did not happen in this game. And and that was a huge detriment to the Wolves, and, and it's one of the reasons they lost. And now you got to play Phoenix, you got to play Milwaukee, teams that are happy to, you know, they're going to take care of the ball. Those are well coached teams, they're veteran teams for the most part, and things won't be as easy as they have been or should have been at least over the first seven games of the season. Another takeaway: bench issues in this game. No Jordan McLaughlin available. Incidentally, tying those, these the last point to this one. Jordan McLaughlin would have been huge to have against the Spurs and he didn't play uh, or I'm sorry. He did play last Wednesday against the Spurs and he had a good game and the Wolves won that game, right? They won fairly easy last Wednesday against the Spurs, but Jordan McLaughlin would have been a great player to have in this game for a couple of reasons. One to provide the ball pressure that D'Angelo Russell seems incapable of providing and to give that defense a bit more of a stick to regarding just perimeter defense at all. Like somebody would have at least attempted to guard. And yeah, J-Max got his limitations, but uh, he would have guarded on defense. He would have put that effort forth that we did not see elsewhere on this Wolves roster on on Sunday. And then on the other end of the floor, he would have been, you know, catalyst isn't the right word, but he would have been somebody to a a true point guard to get the offense rolling. D'Angelo Russell is not a natural point guard. He's a very natural passer of the basketball. He's a fantastic passer of the basketball but he's not a natural point guard. He's a scoring guard that happens to play point guard and be a really good passer. But there's that, that feel that D'Lo doesn't always have. And I'm not talking about like pick and roll feel. I'm not talking about passing feel. He has that. It's the pulse on the game. What to do and when that D'Lo doesn't always exhibit. Jordan McLaughlin for the most part does. And there's a reason he's a backup in this league. And I, I get that. I'm not at all like the argument I'm making here is that Jordan McLaughlin would have made a difference against the Spurs and that D'Angelo Russell happened to also not have a very good game on the same night that Jordan McLaughlin was unavailable for the Wolves due to injury. He would have made a difference. He would have made sense. He's somewhat ironically, somewhat of a Spursy player. Jordan McLaughlin is and uh, would have made a difference in this game, but without him, the bench had a poor game. I mean, outside of Nas Reed, we'll talk about him in studs. It does. Nas was fantastic. We have to point out that when he entered the game late in the third, they were down 14. When he came, when he left the game early in the fourth, the Wolves were only down four. And then the Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert front court gave it all back. Well, not all of it. Gave a lot of it back. Nas was a plus 12 in nine minutes. And I, I'll, I'll remind everyone individual single game, plus minus is very dangerous because it can be a very, it is a very noisy statistic. It never tells the whole story, but it can be a tool used to help parse what happened in the game. Cat was by far a game worse minus 22. I'm he, like all spoiler alert right now. He's not going to get a dud for this game. Carlton Towns was not the Timberwolves problem. So I want to be very clear here. He is not the reason the Wolves lost this game. He was a minus 22 in the plus minus. Nobody else was greater than a minus 10. Nas Reed was a plus 12. Only two Timberwolves players had a positive plus minus. Torian Prince and Nas Reed. Because they were on the floor when the Wolves flipped things from minus four, down 14 to down four, end of third, early fourth quarter. And Nas was fantastic. Besides Nas and Torian Prince, the rest of the Timberwolves bench shot two of 15 from the field. Brent Forbes was one of six. Jalen Noel was one of eight. Kyle Anderson did not attempt a shot in 13 minutes in his return 
for missing the last few games with back spasms. Austin Rivers was 0 of 1. Forbes and Noel combined to shoot themselves 2 of 14 and 0 of 5 from 3. Only attempted two free throws together. Noel only played 10 minutes. He only played two and a half minutes in the second half. He was so bad in the first and and pretty, you know, um, nondescript in the two and a half minutes he played in the second half. And so he just didn't make an appearance to the fourth quarter. Like if the if Forbes and Noel are going to combine to shoot two of 14, you're not going to win very many games. Now, Torian Prince and Nas Reed were very good. Austin Rivers didn't do a whole lot. Kyle Anderson was fine. He didn't attempt a shot from the field. He had four assists, four rebounds in 13 minutes and played fine for his first game, not having played in a while. Not sure if he was on a minutes limitation or not, but he only played 13 minutes. Um, But Noel's got to play better. Bryn Forbes has given the Wolves nothing in the regular season so far. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that he's not a viable rotation option. He, I think he is, and he should be. Um, but it wasn't it in this game. So outside of Torian Prince and Nasrid, you get basically nothing from the bench. All right. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about individual studs and duds. I will name... We'll call. We'll try and keep it to three studs, two duds in this game. That'll be the plan here as we close the show. All right, studs and duds from the Timberwolves' loss to the Spurs. Studs have to talk about Nas Reed. Nas had eleven and two in just nine minutes. And yes, the first stud I'm going to talk about is the guy who played only nine minutes. Nas Reed was fantastic. Scored on a couple of nice Euro steps in the paint. Knocked down an open three. Um, competed defensively. Came out with a steal. Was a plus 12 in nine minutes. Five of seven shooting. One of two outside the arc. Talked about this on the live postcast with Marnie Gellner following the uh, the Wolves game on Sunday. Uh, what's Chris Finch going to do? Like, he's got to get Nas on the floor. Is it going to be at the expense of Rudy Gobert or Carl Anthony Towns? Is it going to just be maybe he's, you know, that that third big, and maybe it'll be at the expense of Kyle Anderson. Part of the reason Kyle Anderson played less in this game was because Nas got some minutes in the second half. I don't think it could be at the expense of Torian Prince. He continues to play really well. Nine points on five shots in this game for Torian, plus a couple rebounds and assists to steal. So, I, you know, I don't know what it is, but at some point, Chris Finch has to find a way. Nas didn't play last time. out. He didn't play on Friday. Finch has to find a spot for Nas reading this rotation. I, I, I don't. I don't know exactly. I think it's going to depend on the matchup. It's going to depend on feel. And Finch does a pretty good job at at substitutions and rotations based on feel, but this is going to be tricky for him to try and figure out. Um, I'm going to give Carl Anthony Towns a stud. I, I recognize, I mentioned the minus 12. I don't care about that in, in this context. Cat had 26, 11, and 4 in this game. He was greater than 50% from the field, 10 of 19. He was only one of seven on threes and Carl's got to shoot better from three and he will. He's a career, what, 40% basically three point shooter. He's not going to have very many one, one of seven nights from three. He was nine of 12 inside the arc, primarily in the paint. He didn't, I don't think he shot more than one mid range two in this game that I can think of. Um, so cat, he had 15 in the first quarter. So 15 of his 26 were in the first quarter. He was aggressive. He was looking for a shot, but making the right decisions. He had four assists in this game. He probably, he should have had more. The Wolves missed a couple open threes that he could have gotten. D'Lo missed. D'Lo's the number one culprit there. Missed a couple of open threes on that would have been cat assists. Carl Anthony Towns was the Wolves' best player on the floor for most of this game. The second half wasn't great, but again, that is across the board. Cat struggled down the stretch with, with putting the ball in the basket, but he was so good in the first quarter and was every bit the player that the Wolves need him to be. In this game, 26, 11 and four plus two blocks and a steal 10 of 19 shooting five of eight at the line. One of seven on threes for cat. Third stud for this game. I I mean, I don't know. I, I can't, it's really tough to give anybody a stud. like ants. Ants line is good. Again, if you don't watch the game and you look, you say, ah, 18 points, six assists, two steals, only one turnover for ant. Well, he was seven of 18 shooting. So 18 points and 18 shots is not exactly what you want. Um, I think he kind of got jobbed a little bit in terms of the officiating. He attempted 15 two pointers in this game and not a ton of mid range shots. He only got to the line for three free throw attempts. The wolves. I didn't talk about this earlier. Marty and I talked a little bit about it on the postcast. The wolves it were whistled for three technicals in this game. Ant Prince and Delo each got one complaining about officiating. And there was a stretch where it was pretty rough. 
I think it was late first, early second quarter. It was whenever Tori and Adilo got consecutive technicals. Um, but like this Wolves team just it just got in their heads and it affected the way they were playing and it, somehow they just stopped moving the ball as much. Everybody wanted to take on the Spurs and therefore take on the officials and try and get the whistle. I, like overall, I don't think the game was that poorly officiated. There was a rough stretch. But like it just a lot, it got too much into their psyche. Now, Ant got the short end of the stick. I think he should have been able to get to the free throw line more than three times on 15 attempts inside the arc. Uh, but it is what it is. I like, I don't know. I'm not going to give a third stud. I'm not going to give Ant that in this game because he was scoreless until midway through the third. And as good as the fourth was, it was kind of a tunnel vision fourth quarter from Anthony Edwards. And and it, it there's some bad habits there, I think, that that are just they're just kind of hanging there still. Um, and as breathtaking as it is when he gets to the basket and makes difficult shots in the paint, and he made a couple of those, it's not exactly the type of offense that Chris Finch is looking for. Duds. This is a lot easier. I'm going to give Rudy Gobert a dud in this game. Nine and 12, or excuse me, yeah, nine and 12. Nine points, 12 rebounds, four of 11 shooting. Um, a couple of blocks, but like I just don't know that his presence was felt as much in this game. Um, I mean, Jakob Pertl was only two of two shooting, but he had 14 rebounds, four assists, a couple steals and three blocks himself. And he had more of an impact. Gobert struggled a little at times with Pertl over these three games against San Antonio. Um, there was a big game mix in there for Rudy, I believe among the three, but, um, I don't know. You just expect a little bit more. You expect a couple of those misses to be better in the paint. There were a couple of weird play calls where Rudy was even after a timeouts where Rudy got a post touch at one point. Like, I just don't know. And that's not really his fault, but like, it's not really his game and Rudy hasn't shown the ability to do that successfully, you know, with any frequency in his career. So like, I don't know. It just wasn't a good game for Rudy. It's disappointing. D'Angelo Russell, 10 points on 17 shots. It's not what you're looking for. Five of 17 shooting. Like that's what, like 30% from the floor. O of seven on three point attempts, five of 10 inside the arc, five of 10 on twos, O of seven on threes, zero free throw attempts, 17 shot attempts, Zero free throw attempts for D'Angelo Russell. 10 points, five rebounds, four assists, one block. A rough game for D'Lo all the way around. Bad defensively. Um, talked about ball pressure first segment, and, and it's not only D'Lo. Ball pressure perimeter defense was poor across the board for Minnesota. D'Angelo Russell was one of the primary culprits in this game. A, a rough game for him to be sure. And then my third dud is going to be uh, Jalen Noel. 10 minutes, one of eight shooting, 0 of three outside the arc, and donuts across the board in every other category, except for he did commit a foul. At least Bryn Forbes did some stuff. He had a couple of steals. He got three rebounds. He had one really nice defensive play where he doubled on, uh, I, I think, I forget who it was, was driving on Cat. Forbes doubled um, from the top of the key and, and got a steal, started a fast break the other way. Like Forbes was at least active. If Jalen Wells not scoring and not doing other stuff, then he's not useful. And I just talked about this the other night. It was either Wednesday or, or, or Friday of last week that Jalen Wells is so different from Malik Beasley for a lot of reasons, right? Like the easy, lazy comparison, if you don't really watch the Wolves, is, oh, he's like the new scorer off the bench, six-man type like Malik. Well, no, their games are very different. But also Jalen Wells is more of a stat stuffer. He does more in the box score, typically. Not in this game. And he only earned himself a two-minute stint in the second half because he was so poor in the first half and pretty invisible in the third quarter. Ten minutes played, two points on one of eight shooting. His only basket was actually like an alley-oop lay-in, a uh, nice pass from Towns. 0 of three on threes, no free throw attempts, zeros across the board, no rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, nothing. Poor game from Jalen Noel. All right. That's all I have for you today here on the show. Tuesday, I'm going to preview Wolves Suns. We'll talk a little bit about what Phoenix has been up to. We'll talk about what needs to change, what the Wolves may try against the Suns, uh, and talk a little more lineups regarding Nas Reed. Once all the lineup data is refreshed on Monday, I'll look at that for Tuesday's show. Nas just had another fantastic game. Like, how could the Wolves get him on the floor more? We'll do all that on Tuesday. Um, a programming reminder that we do live postcasts. If you're listening to this on the audio feed, the, the two shows right before this are postcasts. I did a postcast Friday. I do them live with Marnie Gellner from Bally Sports North. We do them about 45 minutes after the game following her postgame show with Bally. Um, so we did one Friday night following the win over the Lakers. We did one Sunday to, after the loss of the Spurs. Tuesday, I you know, it's a TNT game. Marnie um, is going to have the night off for Bally. So I likely will do the live postcast solo on Tuesday. But typically, Marnie will join me post game about 45 minutes so be sure to subscribe. It's actually live on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. 
And then we post the audio feed after the fact on all the Lockdown Wolves audio channels. This show, Lockdown Wolves, the regular podcast is also on the Lockdown Wolves YouTube as well as audio. So you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts. And uh, you can also download the new Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on either Roku or Amazon Fire TV. Listen to all the Lockdown Minnesota shows, Twins, Vikings, uh, Wild, Golden Gophers, all of it on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku or Amazon Fire TV. Make sure to download that app today. You can also follow this show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves or my account at, at B Beacon. That's with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Lockdown Network is your local experts in all the biggest stories. And this show is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Thanks again for making us your first listen. A reminder that for your second listen, you can listen to the Lockdown Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. Once again, I'm Bed Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.